Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Paul Ogando. I believe some of you guys have sang the words of these songs today, but you don't quite connect with them yet because you have not given God your heart. And, and I want to get that right right now. You have to get right with God this very moment. See, the Word of God says that all who comes to Christ are new creation. All things are made new from that moment on, but you have to come to Him first. So tonight, listen, 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 listen. Tonight, if you have not given God all your heart and all your life, you have to do that tonight. God doesn't like to play games. As a matter of fact, you don't like anybody playing games with you. So He's saying, let's reason here. If you would come to me, will not give you mercy, when I forgive you, restore you. That's what he wants to do for you tonight. But he can't do that unless you acknowledge in your own heart saying, God, I need you. I have a need for you today. I have a need for salvation. I have a need for you to restore me. There was a man named Nicodemus, John chapter 3, that this man knew the Bible, read the Bible, studied it. I mean, he was brilliant. He's having a conversation with Jesus. And in that conversation with Jesus... He says, hey, how do you get to heaven? You know, how do, you, how do we end up there? Because everybody wants to get to heaven. Everybody wants that eternity and that safe place with Jesus. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be, listen to the words, you must be born again. And, and, and born again, what Jesus was telling Nicodemus, listen, you need to become new in your life. Nicodemus says, I'm an old man. How can I be born again. How can I go into my mother's womb and start? See, we're not talking about a physical change tonight. We're talking about a spiritual change. You have to connect with God today. If that's you tonight, if you're saying, Pastor, you know, I've done the church thing and, and I've even prayed a prayer here and there, but I really haven't committed to God all of my heart and all of my life. I want to give you that chance tonight. I want to give you the opportunity to, be, to give God all of your heart and all of your life and not play games with him. That you would really say, I want that to become true in me. I want to I want make all things new on the inside. Jesus, Jesus went to the cross for that very reason. But you have to ask him and you have to invite him tonight. I'm going to give you that chance. In a moment, in a moment, listen, in a moment, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat, get your Bible, whatever you have with you, and you meet me down here. And we're going to pray together and ask Jesus to come into your heart. Pastor, how can I take that step in a church where well, there's a lot of people? You have to. You have to because Jesus, listen, listen, listen. We just talked about this. We just celebrated this a few days ago. Jesus went to the cross publicly, died for you. He was not embarrassed to die for you. He suffered tremendously so that you can get a benefit. And Hebrews said his death became a benefit to all. So he became the author of salvation through it. Now you need to partake of that. This is your moment. This is your moment. Who should come forward? If you're thinking you're not right with God, then come and get right with God. Who should come forward? You should pray it a long time ago. Yeah, I did that prayer. But your life did not follow what your word said. Then you need to be here tonight asking Jesus to come into your heart. Who should come forward tonight? Those who standing there are saying, I know God's spoken to me. And I have to give him all my heart and all my life. I don't want to play with God. This is your moment. As they sing it softly, as they sing moving forward, you get out of your seat. You meet me right here. Whether it be one, ten, I believe there's many. You take a step of faith. We'll meet you right here in that step of faith. And we'll pray together tonight. This is your moment. Because you make all things new. And you make all things new. without getting my life together once again in Christ. I don't want to leave tonight without saying, God, I don't want to play with you anymore. I want all things new in my life. This is your moment. This is your moment. You be brave. You be brave. Thank you. Thank you. You be brave tonight. And you say, God, that's it. Tonight is the night. Tonight is the night where I say, no more games. I want to get my heart right with God. 
give you a moment more because the Spirit is still working in your heart. This is your night. This is your night. This is your night. If you're saying, well, you know, I escaped it because there's a bunch of people there. I don't have to do it. Nope. In the end, it's between you and God. And if you know standing there that you are not right, do not give this opportunity up. This is your moment to say, I, I'm ready, Jesus. I'm ready to not play games with you anymore. This is your moment. This is your moment. So you be brave tonight, just like they have, and say, God, I'm not putting you off anymore. You're not saying yes to the church, though we want to be your church, and we want you to be this great church. You have to say yes to God first. And it all start with that. It all start taking that step and say, I'm saying yes to God tonight. And whether you're recommitting, whether you're, this is your first time, just do it. This is your moment. They'll sing it one more time. And if that's you, you come on down right now. In a minute, we're going to pray together, and we're going to get you some help, some information in your hands. But first, we're going to pray together. But if you would give me just a second more, I, my spirit is not comfortable because I believe there's many more of you tonight. And I'm, I'm not twisting your arm. I just believe God is asking me to wait because you have to do this. This is your opportunity. God is making this moment. He's saying, I want to make all things new. I've already paid the price. Thank you. I've already paid the price. But you have to make the decision. No one, no one else can do that for you. You have to make that decision. This is your moment. This is your moment. Once again, we're stopping because this is your moment. And God is not settled in my heart because he's waiting for you. Let's do that again, Elijah. And you get out of your seat and come right now and put your life back together in Christ. Let him do it. Let him work in you. Cause you right we got time we can wait <laughs> that is so good listen all of you guys who took such a brave step you said man i i want to get my life right some of you guys ran over here and said i'm not waiting anymore that is such an important step you guys have done what many of us have done we took a step too and we trusted god to say god you can make all things new we're going to trust you today together we're going to pray i love praying with people so pastor joel is going to allow me to pray and in a minute then he'll talk with you but we'll pray together as a church why do we have to pray because you have to invite jesus into you. you have to tell him god I said, I'm ready. I'm inviting you. And we all want to pray with you, okay? Would you do that? Would you repeat this prayer after us? Say, Father God, I invite you into my heart. And I ask forgiveness for my sins, the wrongdoings I've committed against you and others. I receive your son and his sacrifice. Lord Jesus, be my king and my savior. Be the leader of my life from this day forward and until eternity in jesus name amen and amen come on listen thank you lord listen i want
want you, I want you to take one more step. Then you'll come back into service. Pastor Joel, one of our pastors, one of our leaders, he wants to pray with you again. If you need prayer, there'll be some SPT, some friends that would help you get stronger. They want to put some material in your hand and say, listen, this is what you need to do to move forward. You made a step. You said, okay, this is one. Now we're going to teach you how to continue to take that step forward so you don't go back. Are you with me? We don't want you to go back. We want to help you continue to move forward in Christ. So go with Pastor Joel, then you'll come back right into service and we'll connect with the message. Is that okay? I'll wait for you. Do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, give him a hand. Let me pray. You can remain sitting. Let me pray. Father God, I ask that you would absolutely continue to speak to our hearts. Lord, we went, we're going after your face tonight. We're going after your face. So Father, come and speak to us through your word. Lord, use me, Father. You can use anybody use me tonight, Father. And we don't come to this house or to the church to hear from a man or woman or to hear from uh, any color that you can imagine somebody preaching, Father. We come to hear from you. So God, use me tonight to speak your words. May your word become true in our hearts, be solid word to affect our life to move forward tonight. That, that's what you would have us do. So do that tonight. Affect our life through your word. Father, just like you bless us here at The Rock, I pray a blessing over other churches that are in the Inland Empire and around the world. Father, we do not consider ourselves better than any other church though we think we're great because that's what you would have us do and that's awesome but we believe them also lord we want to pray for them and those churches and those pastors encourage them to advance your kingdom so many people need the gospel lord god so use them also and bless them as they preach the true word of god we say it in jesus name we say amen amen, amen. listen so tonight if you would um just Kind of stay with me tonight, and if you hear me say any wrong words, uh, English is not my first language, so uh, sometimes certain pronunciations are tricky for me, so I'll do my best. I've worked really hard to, uh, to improve my English. Hopefully, uh, I can do that. So I have to give that disclaimer ahead, so you're uh, like, what did that guy just say? Did he even go to school? Uh, I try. Uh, so, uh, so tonight, just be patient with me as I try to unveil this. Normally, I preach in Spanish, and I am just a train on a road, but in English, I have to think every word before I say it, or you would not get what I'm trying to say or think that I just, like, cussed you out in church, and we don't want to do that, okay? So um, rename it. Rename it. You know, there's a lot of things in our life that probably need a change, a transformation, uh, uh, you know, that are way overdue for us to do something for us to get it. And, and there's something so powerful that God does when he works in our lives. I heard a story of a man um, who went into a house as a thief, and he broke into a house and started stealing stuff, grabbing the computers and grabbing things from inside the house. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice that tells him, Jesus is watching you. And he stops. He's like, What? And he's looking around. There's nobody in the house, so he's just kind of pauses. All right, man, maybe it's just me. So he continues on his, you know, grabbing stuff and putting it back. And again, the voice comes out, Jesus is watching you. And he's like, okay, that's it. I'm fine. So he looks around and sees a closet. He opens the closet and pulls down a curtain, and there's a cage and a parrot inside the cage. And he's like, what? A parrot? Come on. What are you going to do about it? What's your name, parrot? And the parrot says, Moses. What? <laughs> And he's like, come on, what kind of people live in this house? Who would name their parrot Moses? The same guy that named the pit bull Jesus. Get him! No. <laughs> I'm glad you liked that. I saw it was so corny, I just thought I gave it a shot. <laughs> God shows us an interesting pattern in the Word of God when he renames people. He places people throughout the Word of God, and so they come, and a lot of times they get a new word. And God's intent to call, when he renames us, God's intent is to call out from within us what's already there. That's his direct intent. God's intent is to call out of us what's already in us. God's intent in renaming us is to call out of us what is already in us. And many times there's stages in our life where we need a refresher. We need a rename of a particular area. We need God to do that for us. And that is so important for us to get that tonight, that he wants to do that. He doesn't want to repackage you. Let me make that clear. He doesn't want to repackage you. Repackaging is 
I worked in the dental industry, and most of the toothpaste that exists today, what they do, and most products, really, when they get, you get allowed by the FDA, you can rename a product if you change a percentage or even an element of your formula, it's a brand new product. So you will see, you know, 50 different products of the same company, and they're all just about the same product, just a little bit here and a little bit there tweaked, so you get to reinvent, and you get to rename it. God doesn't want to do that with you. He doesn't want to rename something in your area, so it remains the old thing, just changed a little. No, 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 we're talking about moving forward. We're talking about creating a new thing. God wants to rename you to call out what's in you already, if you didn't know that. See, God takes a man named Abram and tells him, hey, Abram, I want you to follow me, and I want you to leave your family and go and do this for me, and I'm going to call you Abraham. I'm going to call you a father of many, yet Abram, Abram at the time had no children, no children, and his wife was barren. So God calls out something that he already knew was in him. And the same he does with several people. He does it with Jacob. He's a trickster. That's what his name means. And he calls him Israel. He calls him because you wrestle with God. You got something out of God. And he becomes the father of many nations. He does it with a man named Cephas. And Cephas is a famous name. is Peter. Jesus sees him and says, hey, you're going to be Peter, man. You're going to be a rock. You're going to be somebody solid. You're going to do something amazing. And Jesus says, God does it with a name, a man named Saul. He says, Saul, you're going to be called Paul, humble one. And God humbled Paul very, very low in a very tough process because he knew God was going to use him in a great and mighty way. God called out of his soul what was already in him. And guys, tonight, people... Uh, all of us tonight here, I want you to know that God wants to rename some things in your life because they're already in you, and he wants to put that name and that stamp in you tonight so that you move forward in something new that he wants to do in you. Are you with me tonight? And it's so important. I was reading in my personal time, and, and I came across this verse that just like, it was kind of odd. And when you're a student of the Word of God, when something just seems like different, you kind of dig in a little. And th this is how I landed, Psalm 108.8. I want you to do something. Get your Bibles, and we're going to stay in the Old Testament. I hope that's okay with everybody. Some people, oh, we got to do New Testament, but Old Testament is plenty of riches for us tonight. So Psalm 108, I want you to go there, Psalm 108, and I also want you to go to Genesis 41, Genesis 41. And you mark your Bible in Genesis because we're going to remain, we're going to look at a lot of verses in Genesis right there together. We're going to talk about the life of a man named Joseph. But the inspiration doesn't come just out of Joseph. It comes out of his children. Look what it says, Psalm 108.8. Psalm 108.8. This is the same verse, by the way. This verse repeats again in the Bible in Psalm 60. The exact same phrase is the exact same word. The psalmist writes it twice for whatever reason. He's trying to make a point. But in Psalm 108.8, it says, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim, or Ephraim, which is the name of his other son, also is the helmet of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. So I read the verse, and I'm like, oh, that's, wow, that's interesting that God would word things that way. But then I, I read it again, and I realize, oh, two of the characters here are Joseph's kids. I wonder why God would do that and call it out and just started digging, and God started speaking to me. He says, Manasseh is mine, and Ephraim, or Ephraim, also is the helmet of my head. So he's making a point. So I went to Genesis 41, where Joseph starts naming his kids and talking about this. Let me just put you in the mindset of where Joseph is at this time. Joseph, um, we we'll talk a lot about a story, but you already know the story. You've seen the movie, young man, one of the children of Israel and Jacob at the time. And so he, his brothers are jealous of him because God has put, out, has put such a calling upon his life and they sell him out into slavery. He goes on for years and years, 15 plus years in slavery, suffering uh, terrible things, rejected by his family, ignored by them, pushed aside. And so finally, finally, God blesses him because he figured out the wisdom that was needed for Pharaoh. And so this is in the blessing of the seven years of blessing. He gets married and has two children. Look at this. It says, <clears throat> Genesis 41, 51 and 52 says, Joseph called the name, Joseph called the name, notice that, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. See, names are important. Names are crucial. You guys already know the story of Jabez. I mean, can you imagine somebody being called, hey, you cost me pain every time? Think about that. If your name was Sorrow, Sorrow this, Sorrow that, you know, hey, Sorrow, take out the trash. It's, just, it's no fun. You know, it's just 
people identify with what they've been called. So, so Joseph is making a point. Joseph is telling the story of his life by naming his children. He's saying Manasseh means for God has made me forget all my toil, meaning my problems and issues and dealings and all my father's house since they forgot about him his brothers just pretty much sold him he doesn't even know they even care he doesn't even know they're looking for him but he said this kid has helped me forget that god helped me then look at verse 52 and verse 52 says and the name of the second he called ephraim ephraim for god has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Wow, Joseph was really narrowing it down. He's saying, these two kids have brought an event in my life that changed me. So I'm going to name them those things. And God gave me just two things. I don't have three points, four points. I have just two things, two phrases that God impacted me. This This is my own personal life. I'm just telling you, this is from my own personal study that God developed this message for us tonight. So if anything, I'm getting something out of it. And God gave me two phrases. And the first phrase God gave me out of uh, Genesis 51 was this, your pain belongs to God. Your pain belongs to God. It doesn't belong to anyone else. God said it twice in the book of Psalms, Manasseh is mine, he's mine, and the name of Manasseh means for God has helped me forget all my toils and all my issues from my father's land and all my problems. God is saying, your issues, your problems are mine. If you lay them at the altar, if you put them in my hands, they're mine. They belong to me. If you allow me to help you forget the things that have brought you pain, I want to be part of that experience. I want to be part of that. God is saying, let me in. Let me work with you. Because Joseph said, this experience is amazing. Your pain belongs to God. You know, as a matter of fact, just this weekend, we celebrated Easter. And we all saw and remember what Jesus did. But this is exactly what Jesus did. And theologically speaking, Joseph is a type of Christ. So we're not going to go into a lot of details. But this is exactly what Jesus did for us. In the book, in the book of Isaiah, look at this. Book of Isaiah 53, 5. Very famous verse. But I've never seen it from this context. Look at this. And I've highlighted the word for you. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. But he was wounded for our transgressions. But he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All of a sudden, the book of Isaiah, before even Jesus came, says, he is going to take your pain and turn it around. He wants to be part of the painful experiences in your life. Right there, even before Jesus showed up on the scene, Isaiah is saying, he's going to come, and when you've been hurt, he's going to take that transgression upon himself. He's going to come, and when you've been bruised in your life because of the wrongdoings you did, he's going to take it upon himself. And when you've been chastised, you've been made fun of, you've been pushed around, you've been pressured, he's going to take that peace, he's going to take that embarrassment and give you peace in return. That's what Jesus is doing in your own life. He wants to restore you and change you tonight. But you have to take it upon yourself and believe what the Word of God says. God has ears for the hurting. God is not the one who's going to bruise you. As a matter of fact, Pastor Jim alluded to that. Is a, another verse in Isaiah that says, He will not break the branch that's already bruised. The branch that's already kind of about to fall off. He's not the one that comes along and goes, ah, I'm just going to break it. No, he's not the one breaking your back. A lot of people say, Pastor, why God brought this sickness upon me? Why did God let me go on unemployment? Why did God let me lose my house? God is not the one breaking you. He wants to be part of your pain. He wants to be part of your pain <clears throat> because pain, listen up, church, pain helps us overcome a lot of things in life. Pain many times does a lot more for us than blessings do in the process. Blessings are the enjoyment of what we went through in pain. And so that is not preached in American churches today because nobody shows up at a church that does that. So we got to tell everybody everything's going to be great and good and you're going to knock and things are going to be great. And th- there's faith. There's got to be faith. But when things are hard and people run from God because God didn't give me what I wanted when I said, that's not how God works. God says, invite me to your pain and I'm going to show you a way out. I'm going to show you a way out. A way out in faith. 
away in the process. That's what Jesus wants to do. Bring him on because he wants to help you. He wants to walk with you. There's a man named Jacob, later become Israel. He's the father of Joseph. And his story is so bizarre. Jacob's story is like from the beginning to the end. It was, it's very interesting story. Jacob um, was supposed to be, you know, was coming in the womb and he fought his way out of the womb. And from day, from day one, he has been fighting in his life. The word of God says that his father was absolutely in love with his oldest son Esau. He was a hunter. He was a hairy man. It says the word of God, not me, Jacob, that Jacob was delicate and was always uh, the favor of his mom. He was, uh, he was a good cook. He was a delicate. I mean, he was just a softy. And so his dad was like, no, man, I want a man's man. I want Esau. So Imagine that. Your father thinks you're lame. Society says you're weird. I mean, it's just everything is against the guy. But God picked him to be the father of every nation, to be Israel, to become the father. Can you imagine that? God did not grab Esau. He took Jacob. Jacob fought to obtain something, but it didn't come without pain. Are you with me tonight? It did not come without pain. I'm not preaching about pain. God's going to do something. But first, pain is a step. It's a process in what we have to go through many times in order to get the things of God. So Jacob offense his brother. You probably know the story. Uh, his brother said, man, I'm going to kill you. You stole my blessing from me. I'm going to kill you. So Jacob said, hey, I'm out of here. So he takes off, right? And his mom said, hey, get out of here. Go to your uncle's house. Go over there. And, uh, you know, so he goes to this guy named Laban. And so when he's over there at Laban's house, Laban makes him work for every penny, for every moment, for years. Jacob is getting, I mean, Pummel, Pummel working hard. He wants to marry um, uh, Jacob. He wants to marry Laban's daughter, the youngest. And so Laban tricks him. And the day of the wedding, the wedding night in the, in the tent, he switches the girls, marries the old. Hey, you went to sleep with my older, so you have to marry her. Man, Jacob's like, what am I going to do? Work some more. Get the other one, the one he really loved. I mean, it's a mess. It's a soap opera. It should be on telenovelas, you know. It should be on. <laughs> but it's awesome. Then you go. Y'all need to stop watching those things. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Go to Genesis 31. Genesis 31. Jacob has had enough. Jacob is just so tired. He gets a dream from God. He just says, Lord, you know, you, you gave me a promise that you were going to bless me. So now it's time. And Pastor Deborah has preached extensively on how Jacob became a blessed man. And, um, and finally, he tells his wife, we're getting out of here. We're leaving. And secretly, they start preparing how to escape. How am I going to get out of here? Secretly, they start doing that. They start getting out of there. And so Laban finds out and goes after Jacob with vengeance. I mean, he wants to get him. Hey, what are you doing? You're taking my girls. You're taking my kids. You're taking, uh, no, that's it. I mean, Laban was mad. But what Laban was not telling Jacob, even though Jacob already knew, is that God has spoken to Laban about Jacob. And look what Jacob says. Jacob is trying to defend himself. Hey, Laban cut up to him. Hey, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that, etc. So listen to the conversation. Jacob says, that's it. Verse, uh, verse 38. I'm reading out of the NIV because it explains a lot more clear. I like how it says it. Verse 38, Genesis 31 says, I have been with you for 20 years now. I have been with you for 20 years. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, meaning they were fruitful, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring your animals torn by the wild bees. So he says, hey, when animals were killed, I didn't even bother you with it. I bore the loss myself. You demanded payment from me and whatever was stolen by the day or night. Has anybody been there? I mean, Jacob is saying, man, I work hard. I do my job. If something gets lost in the company, you take it out of my paycheck. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happens in the Bible too, huh? It, take it out of my paycheck. He's telling him. He's just, he's done with it. Verse 40 says, this was my situation. Look, so now Jacob's telling him, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. This is what I did for you. It says, the heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night. Sleep fled from my eyes, meaning I wasn't even sleeping for years. 41, look at this. It was like this for to empty years. Wow. It was like this for 20 years. Say 20 years. 20 years. It's so important that you see that because many times we get um, tired and frustrated with God if we go through a situation for a week or a day or a month. But Jacob, the greater your future, the greater your pressure, period. The greater your future, 
the greater your pressure. And you have to know that. So you say, you know what? I'm taking heat now, but I'm moving forward because what I have is so much greater than the moment I'm living now. And Jacob says, I've been at this for 20 years. I was in your household. I worked, look at this, for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you changed my wages 10 times. Now you read that verse and say, well, that's not so bad. I mean, he got a race every two years. That's a pretty good ratio. No, the Bible doesn't say that because he got a race. He went down every two years, not up. Verse 42, here's what God does. Verse 42, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, that is so important. Jacob is saying, listen, I know what my father did, and I know the God of my father have been with me. And watch this phrase. You would surely have sent me away empty-handed, but God has seen my hardship. Can you say that line with me? One, two, three. But God has seen my hardship. He sees it. He's not blind to your pain. He's got eyes. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands. And last night, he rebuked you. I love that. Jacob said, guess what I know? That God spoke to you that you've been messing with me. (laughs) Got caught. So God is saying, Jacob, I've been part of your pain. Jacob is that meaning. I know that the God of my father and of my grandfather They've been with me. And because of that, God has blessed me. Listen, invite God into your pain. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's going on, but invite him into your pain. Don't push him away. Don't say, I got to deal with this on my own. I got to do this or that. No, invite him. Say, God, this is raw. This is where I'm at. My job is tough. My, my husband is difficult. My wife is giving me a hard time. Uh, the, the kids from my previous marriage, I can't see them, and I want to see those children. God, help me out in that pain. This is our reality of our life, and God is saying, your pain belongs to me. Those are the words of God for you tonight. Just like Jacob said, just like Joseph said, you know what? This kid reminds me that God is making me forget the painful experiences of my life. Here's a promise I want you to hang on. Because for everything you're believing in God, for everything you're believing in God, there is a promise in the Word of God. Are you with me? And you have to hang on to the promises. You have to get it. So I believe God gave me this promise for us tonight. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, 1 and 3 says, But now... Thus says the Lord, who created you, talking about Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are what? Mine. God is saying you are mine. You you belong to somebody. You're not alone. You are his. Your pain is his. Your issues are his. He's inviting you into his life. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, it shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Look at this, verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And church, that is a promise you have to hang on to say, Lord, man, when the water's coming of issues, of problems, I know that if the water is up to here, somehow I'll be able to get out, breathe, and go back down if I have to. Because God promised to not let me drown in the waters. When the pressures, when the heat of unemployment, of life pressures coming at me, it'll be hot, but it won't burn you because he promised that it will not scorch you because he is with you. He's the God who called you, and this is what he's saying, you're mine, you're mine. Your pain belongs to God, but you have to invite him to be part of it. Are you with me tonight? Number two, if you're going to give him a hand, give it to God. Not doing it for me, you know. Number two, God will bless you where it once hurt you. God will bless you where it once hurt you. God will bless you where it once hurt you. Many people, and this could be true for many, people have to change situations, locations in order to move on in life. But for most of us, most of the time, God wants to bless you exactly in the place you're at right now. I'll repeat that just in case you didn't believe me. God wants to bless you exactly where you're at right now. What do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean? I want to be done with this. I want to be done with this area of my life. I want to move on to this particular place. I can't stand this place, or I can do X, Y, Z. God wants to bless you exactly in the place you're at. You know, a great example of this is actually the rock. Every time I hear the, the story of the church, I am just amazed and blown away. And I, I want you to know, you're probably not in church life 24-7 like we are, but in church life, 
There are not many churches in inner city the size and effectiveness of The Rock. There are not. They're usually in the suburbs. They're usually where there's money, there's nice people, you know, nobody comes with issue, or at least they hide it really good. Um, but, you know, this is, The Rock is something else. And, and it, it was the faith of Pastor Jim and Deborah. It was the faith of those who pushed through. It was the faith of many who's been here for 20 plus years since they started. It was the faith. And, and so when we see this, when we see that we, this is a testimony of the phrase I'm telling you, that God wants to bless you right where it once hurt you, right where it was difficult, in the same place he wants to bring something about. Because here's why, here's why. I'm going to give you the punchline up front so you know. Because when God blesses you where you're hurt, then others will see that there's a true God operating in your life, period. That's it. When they see it, they go, man, I thought these guys were down and out, but look at them. I thought he was done, but look at them. God wants to bless you right where he once hurt you. Look at the phrase that Joseph uses. Genesis 41, 52, he says, And the name of the second, the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful, and I've always known that, but I've never paid attention to the second line. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my what? Ooh. God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I mean, the story, Joseph would have been great. Pharaoh said, man, you've been in prison. You know what? You're, go, you're free to go home. Go meet up with mom and dad. And man, that's going to be awesome. But, but no, God kept them right in the spot where he went through hard times, difficult times, because he wanted to bless them. I love the message. And, and it's a funny phrase, uh, kind of cliche, but it's so true. Look at the message. The message says, he named his second uh, son, Ephraim, Double prosperity, double prosperity. Can you say double prosperity? One, two, and three. Double, double is double. I've heard a phrase that's called double for your trouble. Double for your trouble. And so he called him and said, you know what? I'm going to get double of what happened to me because I'm going to remain in God. I'm going to invite God into my pain. Then I'm going to let him bless me right where I'm at. Right where I'm at. And look at it. Let's follow. I'm going to read a few verses, so stay with me. Genesis 39. We're almost finishing tonight. You okay for, with me tonight? Okay. Wake up the neighbor and let me finish. No, just kidding. Genesis 39. I'm going to read a sequence so you can see how God blessed Joseph in difficulty. Look how it starts right away. Genesis 39, verse 1 through 4 says, Now Joseph has been, had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So we already know his brother sold him, Ishmaelites bought him, sold him to Potiphar as a slave. Next phrase, verse number two. The Lord was with Joseph, and he did nothing. He was what? He was successful. He was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, verse number three, and his master saw once again that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, he had put under his authority. Joseph was a slave. Joseph was being blessed in the place of his pain. In the place of his pain, wait, the pain gets even deeper. The pain gets deeper. Joseph gets accused of, of wanting to sleep with Potiphar's wife. It's a total lie. How many people have lied about you and you pay the consequences? You have an example in the Bible. You have an example in the Bible. Somebody said, hey, this guy's doing this when you really weren't doing it. But look what God did. So he goes to prison. Verse 20 of Genesis 39 says, Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. I love how the Bible doesn't exaggerate. Said prison, I think, three times. He's trying to get the point across. He was in jail. You got it? He was down and now maximum security. He was locked up. That's it. Make it clear. Now look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. In modern term, he got the best food, he got a good place, he got the best jobs to do, even though he was in a rough place. Verse 22, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Can you imagine that? 
Can you imagine that much power in a prison as a prisoner because you were doing the right thing? Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with who? With him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. The Lord made it to what? prosper. Church, God wants to bless you in the place of your pain, in the place of your toil, in the place of your difficulty, in the job you're in now, in the neighborhood you're in now, in that place. I'm not saying he wants to leave you there because Joseph didn't stay there, but I'm telling you that he can bless you right where you are at, right where you're at. And we have to believe that. We have to believe that God wants to advance us in that. I don't think I've ever shared this, but I want to share it so you understand that I'm not just preaching to you. I believe God is doing all, something for us. A few years ago, when the housing crisis came along, just like many people, I lost my house. And so in the process of doing that, I mean, I worked really hard at doing everything that I had to do and all that. And so in the end, we ended up doing a, a short sale talk to the bank. Hey, we're not coming to terms. It was a very difficult a process situation. And so many people went through it. It's a common thing nowadays. But I remember I... Somebody across was renting a house, literally the same street. We loved our street. We, my kids had all their friends in that street. The person across the street was moving. So I asked, hey, are you renting it to the owner? Yeah, I'm going to rent it. Hey, would you rent it to me? Sure. So I literally, <laughs> it was a fun, somebody took a picture of us, literally grabbed stuff from my house and crossed the street and put it in the other house. <laughs> It was awesome. Um, so, so I saved on truck. My feet were killing me from crossing the street over. And don't ever do that. Um, so it was, you know, we just kind of played it off and believed. But I remember, I remember one day um, I, was looking, I was looking out and I woke up early in the morning, come out, and I remember seeing, obviously, the house is right there. And I remember telling God, I was like, God, man, I got, I got to move. Because every time I wake up and come out of my house, what's painful, what's across the street reminds me of my pain. What's across the street reminds me of my pain. How many of you guys have been in front of what hurts you constantly? How many of you have been right in front of it? Right in front of it. But I remember one day when God showed me all the other good things he had done, even through a painful experience. I mean, our neighbors have asked us, man, how are you guys doing? We're doing better now than we were before. They're being blessed. We have, they've opened their hearts for us to share the gospel with them where before wasn't even an option. God has done all these things in a seemingly difficult situation. You know what? Because when they thought we were going to just spiral down into nothing, God turns her around and we're doing way better than we've ever done before. In many areas, our kids are healthy. Things are doing great. We have a, a great, we've kept our reputation in the streets. We are Christians. We believe in God. We believe God's going to do something. So if Even if it's difficult for you, I want you to know that even if you're staring at what hurts you in the face, God wants to bless you in the place of your pain. And you can't run away from it. You can't run away from it. Here's another thing. Here's one more, very painful. If you give me two more minutes, I'm almost done. Is that okay? Genesis 40 then says, then, then Joseph is in the prison, two high-end prisoners kind of deal, get locked up. They work for Pharaoh directly, the butler and uh, the cupbearer, uh, the cupbearer butler and the bread, you know, the guy from the bakery, the baker. So they come in and, um, and so Joseph is there and they have a dream. And Joseph tells them the dream. He says, man, to you, they're going to cut your head off the next day and to you, you're going to be promoted. Obviously, the guy was going to, the head gets caught up. Ah, that's not a prophecy, man. You don't know what you're talking about. The other guy, well, yeah, I'll take, take my blessing, glory, you know, when it's good news. Um, so, so they do that. And exactly as Joseph said, it happened. Exactly. Uh, and a few days later, guy gets his head chopped off because he did something wrong. And the cup bear goes back to his job. Look at this phrase. Joseph tells him, says, Hey, man, since I told you a dream and I've encouraged you, would you remember me when you're in the high place? You know you've thrown that phrase around when somebody's getting promoted. Hey, man, I know you're going up to the big boss. <laughs> remember those little cronies down here when you're up there. Genesis 40, 23 says, Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Have you been forgotten? Have you thought somebody was due to you, but it just didn't come in the time that you thought it would come? Look at the next line. Genesis 41.1 says, Then it came to pass. It says, it came to pass. It came to pass. Oh, say like you believe it. It came to pass. It came to pass. It came to pass. That at the end of two full years, now two full years weren't bad, where Joseph was like, man, these guys, they just flat out forgot me. I was nice to them. 
they don't remember me. How many of you guys have been through that? Man, I was nice to you, and now that you're doing great, well, I'm just a memory, if that, anymore, you know? Hey, what's going on? I mean, we've all been in those painful situations, but it says, and it came to pass. You know what came to pass? That after two years, Pharaoh had a dream, Pharaoh had a dream, and that dream, the cupbearer remembered, hey, I know somebody in jail that helped me, that could probably help you, Pharaoh, and that's how the process ends. Joseph goes up there, and now Joseph is the second guy in command above everyone else but Pharaoh, just because he did two things. He invited God into his pain, and he trusted God to bless him right where it was hurting. If you do that tonight, God's going to do something amazing for you in your own life. Would you give God a hand for that? Here's the promise of the Lord for you that I want you to get a hold of tonight. Psalm 126.5 in the New Living Translation says, Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. Those who plant in tears with harvest with shouts of joy. If you've been planting in tears, toiling, working, doing hard, nobody sees what you're doing, but you know you're working hard, I want you to know that every single tear is going to turn around and you're going to celebrate down those aisles because that's a promise of the Lord for us tonight. Invite him to his pain. Let him bless you with you. Our God spoke to you tonight. Give him a great big amen in the hand. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.